Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. We are back again with my impressions of King Arthur Knight's Tale. I am more than halfway through the game, but there's a massive amount of content, so unfortunately a full review won't be up in time for the release. Once I am finished, we will definitely unravel all of the game systems, but this video has some general thoughts about the experience. If there's other content you want to see regarding the game, please let me know in the comments below. Starting with the things that I like, the premise for this game is fantastic. You play as Sir Mordred, who in King Arthur's legend is his villainous nephew and the person who ends up killing the beloved king. In King Arthur Knight's Tale, both Sir Mordred and King Arthur are already dead and in Avalon, which is essentially the afterlife. An attempt was made to resurrect King Arthur, but it went horribly wrong, and now he is spreading death and disease throughout the land. Sir Mordred is the only person who was able to successfully kill King Arthur, so he is resurrected to deal with his uncle once again. The reason this premise works so well is throughout the game you are bombarded with cameos from characters in the King Arthur mythos, some of whom are very popular, like Queen Guinevere and others who had relatively small roles like Percival's sister, Lady Dendrain. Many of the characters who only had small side roles in the original lore have been chained significantly by Avalon. Going back to Lady Dendrain, she is not a warrior in the mythos, but in this game, she has been a mainstay on my team as a fire archer since the very beginning. All of these characters knew Sir Mordred before coming to Avalon, and some of them still consider him to be a mortal enemy. That is balanced by their understanding that what Arthur has become is a much bigger threat. This creates a lot of uneasy alliances and fascinating dialogue. Another reason these cameos work so well is all the different characters have their own class, and the class system in this game is absolutely fantastic, with a lot of versatility and hard decisions to be made. Sir Mordred is locked into being a defender, but over the course of the game you will come across a couple dozen different heroes that will serve as your champion, Vanguard, Marksman, Sage, or Arcanist. What really makes the system unique is that two characters can share the same class but have a different list of abilities available to them. So you might have one champion with cleave, which allows them to hit up to three enemies at one time. Then you can have another champion who doesn't have cleave, but he does have power attack, which lets him do more damage to enemies with armor. Sir Mordred gets access to lightning powers as you advance in the game. Sir Percival is also a defender, but he has no lightning powers. Instead, he has a sword of pure flame, and he can use it as a basic attack, something Sir Mordred is unable to do. There are dozens of differences just like this, and it creates an absolutely amazing experience from a mechanic standpoint. It also can cause you to become attached to a particular character even if you don't care for their background or voice acting. This system dovetails perfectly into combat, which is an absolute blast to play. There is nothing better than taking your time to get a build just right and then jump into combat to see it play out exactly like you envisioned. On the other hand, it's also just as exciting to think you have a handle on things and then watch as the game puts new spins on your encounters to keep everything feeling fresh. The type of enemies you face and their tactics change over the course of the game, creating a really nice ebb and flow to the difficulty. In addition, even though this game is turn-based, combat actually feels fast-paced. You are able to fast-forward the enemy's attacks, your characters do not move slowly, and with proper tactics, you can mow down multiple enemies at a time. I also really enjoy the morality system that is implemented in the game. It's a two-axis system and you have to choose your religion, Christianity or Old Faith, and your morality, righteous or tyrant. The game will present you with problems whose solution will push your morality in one of these directions. The cool thing about it is these choices add a great deal of replayability to the game. Some knights flat out cannot be recruited unless you have a specific morality, such as Sir Lancelot, who you will never meet unless you have a strong sense of righteousness. Morgan Le Fay, King Arthur's sister, is only available for recruitment if you strongly believe in the old faith. These choices also significantly impact your relationship with knights you've already recruited. 
all of your knights have a loyalty rating. And if it gets too low, not only will it negatively impact their performance in combat, but some people will leave your round table. My current playthrough is as a righteous Christian. Appeasing Guinevere and Merlin, who both believe in the old faith, has been quite the ordeal. The higher your affinity in a religion your knights don't agree with, the bigger the penalty you will get to their loyalty. There are also some upgrades in Camelot that are tied to specific morality choices. I am definitely looking forward to playing the game as an old faith tyrant to get different choices and knights. There is one aspect of the game I am neutral on. At the beginning of the game, you take over Camelot, but it is completely run down and you have to rebuild it from scratch. There are a ton of different options and functionality the castle provides, and I think it's implemented very well. The problem is, in my opinion, the ability to upgrade this castle comes too slowly. I would say I am more than three quarters of the way through the game. I am nowhere near 75% complete with the upgrades. In fact, I feel like I will finish this game without having fully upgraded the castle. Now, on the one hand, you could say that's a good thing because it really forces you to make hard decisions about what is important. But me personally, I don't like that sort of mindset when it comes to my hub. I am a completionist, so I want to know I'll be able to upgrade everything and have it completely down prior to the end of my playthrough. We'll definitely circle back on this in the full review, since my thoughts might change after finishing the game. Quick note before we get into what I don't like about the game. If you enjoy this video, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. This information tells me which content the channel is enjoying and helps my video spread to more people. I really appreciate all of the support. There's only one significant issue that I have with this game, but it's a huge one that I think mars the experience. This game limits how many heroes you can have at one time. So you have the actual team you are playing with, and then there are four slots that essentially serve as your bench. These characters on your bench just sit there. They are not allowed to do anything. If your main team is full, but you want somebody from your bench activated, then you need to dismiss or essentially delete one of your active heroes. So for example, if you are 20 hours in, your team is full, and you just did a mission that recruits Merlin, he will be placed on your bench first. Then you have to make a decision about who you want to delete to make room for him. This system is atrocious. All of your party members have a quest associated with them where you hear their backgrounds and develop a relationship. These quests are oftentimes great stories that are deeply tied in with their lore. Even if you never use a particular character, you probably still have no interest in just deleting them off of your team. There is no reasoning given for why your party size is limited or honestly why you even need a bench. There are no situations where you are using all of your party members at one time, so it's not like letting you keep them unbalances the game. Also, knights do not automatically gain XP, and there are a limited number of ways for them to get XP, further ensuring you cannot have 20 fully leveled knights. There is no option to take an active party member and swap them with somebody on the bench. Again, overall, I think this system is terrible, and it gets worse as you get deeper into the game and are forced to remove more party members. I have one other issue, but take this with a grain of salt, since I have not finished the game. At this time, I haven't experienced more than a couple of throwaway comments that acknowledge Sir Mordred has changed as a person. He was known as a tyrant and a murderer in life. I again have played him as a strictly righteous person. This has not caused any of my old enemies to see me in a different light or acknowledge maybe things are different now. I think that's a little disappointing, but it could be that this isn't really dealt with until the end of the game. Overall, thus far, I am having a fantastic time with the game. It makes great use of King Arthur's lore, and Neocore Games has really put their own unique spin on it. The game releases April 26 on Steam for PC. It will come out on Xbox and PlayStation at a later date. Hope all of you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave me a like, share this content, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.